Section 11 of Youth by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by C. J. Hogarth. Chapters 41 through 45. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapters 41 through 45. Chapter 41. My Friendship with the Nekhludoffs. At this period, indeed, my friendship with Dmitri hung by a hair. I had been criticizing him too long not to have discovered faults in his character, for it is only in first youth that we love passionately and therefore love only perfect people. As soon as the mists engendered by love of this kind begin to dissolve and to be penetrated by the clear beams of reason, we see the object of our adoration in his true shape, and with all his virtues and failings exposed. Some of those failings strike us with the exaggerated force of the unexpected, and combine with the instinct for novelty and the hope that perfection may yet be found in a fellow-man to induce us not only to feel coldness, but even aversion, towards the late object of our adoration. Consequently, desiring it no longer, we usually cast it from us, and pass onwards to seek fresh perfection. For the circumstance that that was not what occurred with respect to my own relation to Dmitri, I was indebted to his stubborn, punctilious, and more critical than impulsive attachment to myself, a tie which I felt ashamed to break. Moreover, our strange vow of frankness bound us together. We were afraid that if we parted we should leave in one another's power all the incriminatory moral secrets of which we had made mutual confession. At the same time, our rule of frankness had long ceased to be faithfully observed, but, on the contrary, proved a frequent cause of constraint, and brought about strange relations between us. Almost every time that winter that I went upstairs to Dmitri's room, I used to find there a university friend of his named Bezobyedov, with whom he appeared to be very much taken up. Bezobyedov was a small, slight fellow with a face pitted over with smallpox, freckled effeminate hands, and a huge flaxen moustache, much in need of the comb. He was invariably dirty, shabby, uncouth, and uninteresting. To me Dmitri's relations with him were as unintelligible as his relations with Lubov Sergeyevna, and the only reason he could have had for choosing such a man for his associate was that, in the whole university, there was no worse-looking student than Bezobyedov. Yet that alone would have been sufficient to make Dmitri extend him his friendship. And, as a matter of fact, in all his intercourse with this fellow, he seemed to be saying proudly, I care nothing who a man may be. In my eyes every one is equal. I like him, and therefore he is a desirable acquaintance. Nevertheless, I could not imagine how he could bring himself to do it, nor how the wretched Bezobyedov ever contrived to maintain his awkward position. To me the friendship seemed a most distasteful one. One night I went up to Dmitri's room to try and get him to come down for an evening's talk in his mother's drawing-room, where we could also listen to Berenika's reading and singing. But Bezobyedov had forestalled me there, and Dmitri answered me curtly that he could not come down, since, as I could see for myself, he had a visitor with him. Besides, he added, what is the fun of sitting there? We had much better stay here and talk. I scarcely relished the prospect of spending a couple of hours in Bezobyedov's company, yet could not make up my mind to go down alone. Wherefore, cursing my friend's vagaries, I seated myself in a rocking-chair and began rocking myself silently to and fro. I felt vexed with them both for depriving me of the pleasures of the drawing-room, and my only hope as I listened irritably to their conversation was that Bezobyedov would soon take his departure. A nice guest indeed to be sitting with, I thought to myself, when a footman brought in tea, and Dmitri had five times to beg Bezobyedov to have a cup, for the reason that the bashful guest thought it incumbent upon him always to refuse it at first, and to say, No, help yourself. I could see that Dmitri had to put some restraint upon himself as he resumed the conversation. He tried to inveigle me also into it, but I remained glum and silent. I do not mean to let my face give any one the suspicion that I am bored, was my mental remark to Dmitri as I sat quietly rocking myself to and fro with measured beat. Yet, as the moments passed, I found myself, not without a certain satisfaction, 
growing more and more inwardly hostile to my friend. What a fool he is, I reflected. He might be spending the evening agreeably with his charming family, yet he goes on sitting with this brute. We'll go on doing so, too, until it is too late to go down to the drawing-room. Here I glanced at him over the back of my chair, and thought the general look of his attitude and appearance so offensive and repellent that at the moment I could gladly have offered him some insult, even a most serious one. At last Bezobiedov rose, but Dmitri could not easily let such a delightful friend depart, and asked him to stay the night. Fortunately, Bezobiedov declined the invitation and departed. Having seen him off, Dmitri returned, and smiling a faintly complacent smile as he did so, and rubbing his hands together, in all probability partly because he had sustained his character for eccentricity, and partly because he had got rid of a bore, started to pace the room, with an occasional glance at myself. I felt more offended with him than ever. How can he go on walking about the room and grinning like that? was my inward reflection. "'What are you so angry about?' he asked me suddenly, as he halted in front of my chair. "'I am not in the least angry,' I replied, as people always do answer under such circumstances. "'I am merely vexed that you should play-act to me, and to Bezobiedov, and to yourself.' "'What rubbish!' he retorted. "'I never play-act to any one.' "'I have in mind our rule of frankness,' I replied, "'when I tell you that I am certain you cannot bear this Bezobiedov any more than I can.' He is an absolute cad, yet for some inexplicable reason or another it pleases you to masquerade before him. Not at all. To begin with, he is a splendid fellow, and—but I tell you it is so. I also tell you that your friendship for Lubov Sergeyevna is founded on the same basis, namely, that she thinks you a god. And I tell you once more that it is not so. Oh, I know it for myself, I retorted with the heat of suppressed anger and designing to disarm him with my frankness. I have told you before, and I repeat it now, that you always seem to like people who say pleasant things to you, but that, as soon as ever I come to examine your friendship, I invariably find that there exists no real attachment between you." "'Oh, but you are wrong,' said Dmitri, with an angry straightening of the neck in his collar. When I like people, neither their praise nor their blame can make any difference to my opinion of them. Well, dreadful though it may seem to you, I confess that I myself often used to hate my father, when he abused me, and to wish that he was dead. In the same way you—speak for yourself! I am very sorry that you could ever have been so—no, no! I cried as I leapt from my chair and faced him with the courage of exasperation. It is for yourself that you ought to feel sorry, sorry because you never told me a word about this fellow. You know that was not honourable of you. Nevertheless. I will tell you what I think of you." And burning to wound him even more than he had wounded me, I set out to prove to him that he was incapable of feeling any real affection for anybody, and that I had the best of grounds, as in very truth I believed I had, for reproaching him. I took great pleasure in telling him all this, but at the same time forgot that the only conceivable purpose of my doing so, to force him to confess to the faults of which I had accused him, could not possibly be attained at the present moment when he was in a rage. Had he, on the other hand, been in a condition to argue calmly, I should probably never have said what I did. The dispute was verging upon an open quarrel, when Dmitri suddenly became silent and left the room. I pursued him, and continued what I was saying. But he did not answer. I knew that his failings included a hasty temper, and that he was now fighting it down. Wherefore I cursed his good resolutions the more in my heart. This, then, was what our rule of frankness had brought us to, the rule that we should tell one another everything in our minds, and never discuss one another with a third person. Many a time we had exaggerated frankness to the pitch of making mutual confession of the most shameless thoughts, and of shaming ourselves by voicing to one another proposals or schemes for attaining our desires. Yet those confessions had not only failed to draw closer the tie which united us, but had dissipated sympathy and thrust us further apart, until now pride would not allow him to expose his feelings, even in the smallest detail, and we employed in our quarrel the very weapons which we had formerly surrendered to one another, the weapons which could strike the shrewdest blows. CHAPTER Forty Two, OUR STEPMOTHER 
Notwithstanding that Papa had not meant to return to Moscow before the New Year, he arrived in October, when there was still good riding to hounds to be had in the country. He alleged as his reason for changing his mind that his suit was soon to come on before the Senate. But Mimi averred that Avdotia had found herself so ennuyee in the country, and had so often talked about Moscow and pretended to be unwell, that Papa had decided to accede to her wishes. You see, she never really loved him. She and her love only kept buzzing about his ears because she wanted to marry a rich man," added Mimi, with a pensive sigh, which said, to think what a certain other person could have done for him if only he had valued her. Yet that certain other person was unjust to Avdotia, seeing that the latter's affection for Papa, the passionate, devoted love of self-abandonment, revealed itself in her every look and word and movement. At the same time, that love in no way hindered her, not only from being averse to parting with her adored husband, but also from desiring to visit Madame Annette's, and order there a lovely cap, a hat trimmed with a magnificent blue ostrich feather, and a blue Venetian velvet bodice which was to expose to the public gaze the snowy, well-shaped breast and arms which no one had yet gazed upon except her husband and maids. Of course Katenka sided with her mother, and in general there became established between Avdotia and ourselves, from the day of her arrival, the most extraordinary and burlesque order of relations. As soon as she stepped from the carriage, Woloda assumed an air of great seriousness and ceremony, and, advancing towards her, with much bowing and scraping, said in the tone of one who was presenting something for acceptance, I have the honour to greet the arrival of our dear mamma, and to kiss her hand. Ah, my dear son, she replied, with her beautiful unvarying smile. And do not forget the younger son, I said, as I also approached her hand, with an involuntary imitation of Woloda's voice and expression. Had our stepmother and ourselves been certain of any mutual affection, that expression might have signified contempt for any outward manifestation of our love. Had we been ill-disposed towards one another, it might have denoted irony, or contempt for pretense, or a desire to conceal from papa, standing by the while, our real relations, as well as many other thoughts and sentiments. But as a matter of fact, that expression, which well consorted with Avdotia's own spirit, simply signified nothing at all, simply concealed the absence of any definite relations between us. In later life I often had occasion to remark, in the case of other families whose members anticipated among themselves relations not altogether harmonious, the sort of provisional burlesque relations which they formed for daily use. And it was just such relations as those which now became established between ourselves and our stepmother. We scarcely ever strayed beyond them, but were polite to her, conversed with her in French, bowed and scraped before her, and called her chère maman, a term to which she always responded in a tone of similar lightness and with her beautiful unchanging smile. Only the lachrymose Lubotshka, with her goose feet and artless prattle, really liked our stepmother, or tried in her naive and frequently awkward way to bring her and ourselves together. Wherefore the only person in the world for whom, besides papa, Avdotia had a spark of affection, was Lubotshka. Indeed, Avdotia always treated her with a kind of grave admiration and timid deference which greatly surprised me. From the first, Avdotia was very fond of calling herself our stepmother, and hinting that, since children and servants usually adopt an unjust and hostile attitude towards a woman thus situated, her own position was likely to prove a difficult one. Yet, though she foresaw all the unpleasantness of her predicament, she did nothing to escape from it by, for instance, conciliating this one, giving presents to that other one, and forbearing to grumble the last a precaution which it would have been easy for her to take, seeing that by nature she was in no way exacting, as well as very good-tempered. Yet not only did she do none of these things, but her expectation of difficulties led her to adopt the defensive before she had been attacked. That is to say, supposing that the entire household was designing to show her every kind of insult and annoyance, she would see plots where no plots were and consider that her most dignified course was to suffer in silence, an attitude of passivity as regards winning 
affection, which of course led to disaffection. Moreover, she was so totally lacking in that faculty of apprehension to which I have already referred as being highly developed in our household, and all her customs were so utterly opposed to those which had long been rooted in our establishment, that those two facts alone were bound to go against her. From the first, her mode of life in our tidy, methodical household was that of a person only just arrived there. Sometimes she went to bed late, sometimes early, sometimes she appeared at luncheon, sometimes she did not, sometimes she took supper, sometimes she dispensed with it. When we had no guests with us, she more often than not walked about the house in a semi-nude condition, and was not ashamed to appear before us, even before the servants, in a white chemise, with only a shawl thrown over her bare shoulders. At first this bohemianism pleased me, but before very long it led to my losing the last shred of respect which I felt for her. What struck me as even more strange was the fact that, according as we had or had not guests, she was two different women. The one, the woman figuring in society, was a young and healthy, but rather cold, beauty, a person richly dressed, neither stupid nor clever, and unfailingly cheerful. The other woman, the one in evidence when no guests were present, was considerably past her first youth, languid, depressed, slovenly, and ennui, though affectionate. Frequently, as I looked at her when smiling, rosy with the winter air, and happy in the consciousness of her beauty, she came in from a round of calls and, taking off her hat, went to look at herself in a mirror, or when, rustling in her rich, décolleté ball dress, and at once shy and proud before the servants, she was passing to her carriage, or when, at one of our small receptions at home, she was sitting dressed in a high silken dress finished with some sort of fine lace about her soft neck and flashing her unvarying but lovely smile around her. As I looked at her at such times, I could not help wondering what would have been said by persons who had been ravished to behold her thus if they could have seen her, as I often saw her, namely, when waiting in the lonely midnight hours for her husband to return from his club, she would walk like a shadow from room to room, with her hair dishevelled and her form clad in a sort of dressing-jacket. Presently she would sit down to the piano and, her brows all puckered with the effort, play over the only waltz that she knew, after which she would pick up a novel, read a few pages somewhere in the middle of it, and throw it aside. Next, repairing in person to the dining-room, so as not to disturb the servants, she would get herself a cucumber and some cold veal, and eat it standing by the window-sill, then once more resume her weary, aimless, gloomy wandering from room to room. But what, above all other things, caused estrangement between us, was that lack of understanding which expressed itself chiefly in the peculiar air of indulgent attention with which she would listen when any one was speaking to her concerning matters of which she had no knowledge. It was not her fault that she acquired the unconscious habit of bending her head down, and smiling slightly with her lips, only when she found it necessary to converse on topics which did not interest her which meant any topic except herself and her husband. Yet that smile, and that inclination of the head, when incessantly repeated, could become unbearably wearisome. Also, her peculiar gaiety, which always sounded as though she were laughing at herself, at you and at the world in general, was gauche and anything but infectious, while her sympathy was too evidently forced. Lastly, she knew no reticence with regard to her ceaseless rapturizing to all and sundry concerning her love for papa. Although she only spoke the truth when she said that her whole life was bound up with him, and although she proved it her life long, we considered such unrestrained, continual insistence upon her affection for him bad form, and felt more ashamed for her when she was descanting thus before strangers even than we did when she was perpetrating bad blunders in French. Yet although, as I have said, she loved her husband more than anything else in the world, and he too had a great affection for her, or at all events he had at first, and when he saw that others besides himself admitted her beauty, it seemed almost as though she purposely did everything most likely to displease him, simply to prove to him the strength of her love, her readiness to sacrifice herself for his sake and the fact that her one aim in life was to win his affection. 
She was fond of display, and my father too liked to see her as a beauty who excited wonder and admiration. Yet she sacrificed her weakness for fine clothes to her love for him, and grew more and more accustomed to remain at home in a plain grey blouse. Again, papa considered freedom and equality to be indispensable conditions of family life, and hoped that his favourite Lubotshka and his kind-hearted young wife would become sincere friends. Yet once again Avdosia sacrificed herself by considering it incumbent upon her to pay the real mistress of the house, as she called Lubotshka, an amount of deference which only shocked and annoyed my father. Likewise, he played cards a great deal that winter, and lost considerable sums toward the end of it. Wherefore, unwilling as usual to let his gambling affairs intrude upon his family life, he began to preserve complete secrecy concerning his play. Yet Abdosia, though often ailing, as well as towards the end of the winter, and sent, considered herself bound always to sit up in a grey blouse and with her hair dishevelled, where my father, when at, say, four or five o'clock in the morning, he returned home from the club ashamed, depleted in pocket, and weary. She would ask him absent-mindedly whether he had been fortunate in play, and listen with indulgent attention, little nods of her head, and a faint smile upon her face as he told her of his doings at the club, and begged her for about the hundredth time never to sit up for him again. Yet, though papa's winnings or losings, upon which his substance practically depended, in no way interested her, she was always the first to meet him when he returned home in the small hours of the morning. This she was incited to do, not only by the strength of her devotion, but by a certain secret jealousy from which she suffered. No one in the world could persuade her that it was really from his club, and not from a mistress's, that papa came home so late. She would try to read love secrets in his face, and discerning none there, would sigh with a sort of enjoyment of her grief and give herself up once more to the contemplation of her unhappiness. As the result of these and many other constant sacrifices which occurred in papa's relations with his wife during the latter months of that winter, a time when he lost much and was therefore out of spirits, there gradually grew up between the two an intermittent feeling of tacit hostility, of unrestrained aversion to the object of devotion of the kind which expresses itself in an unconscious eagerness to show the object in question every possible species of petty annoyance. CHAPTER Forty Three, NEW COMRADES The winter had passed imperceptibly, and the thaw begun, when the list of examinations was posted at the university, and I suddenly remembered that I had to return answers to questions in eighteen subjects on which I had heard lectures delivered, but with regard to some of which I had taken no notes and made no preparation whatever. It seems strange that the question, how am I going to pass, should never have entered my head, but the truth is that all that winter I had been in such a state of haze through the delights of being both grown up and comil faux, that whenever the question of the examinations had occurred to me, I had mentally compared myself with my comrades, and thought to myself, they are certain to pass, and as most of them are not comil faux, and I am therefore their personal superior, I too am bound to come out all right. In fact, the only reason why I attended lectures at all was that I might become an habitué of the university, and obtain papa's leave to go in and out of the house. Moreover, I had many acquaintances now, and often enjoyed myself vastly at the university. I loved the racket, talking, and laughter in the auditorium, the opportunities for sitting on a back bench, and letting the measured voice of the professor lower one into dreams as one contemplated one's comrades the occasional runnings across the way for a snack and a glass of vodka, sweetened by the fearful joy of knowing that one might be hauled before the professor for so doing, the stealthy closing of the door as one returned to the auditorium, and the participation in course versus course scuffles in the corridors. All this was very enjoyable. By the time, however, that every one had begun to put in a better attendance at lectures, and the professor of physics had completed his course and taken his leave of us until the examinations came on, and the students were busy collecting their notebooks and arranging to do their preparation in parties, it struck me that I also had better prepare for the ordeal. Operoff, with whom I still continued on bowing, but otherwise most frigid terms, suddenly offered not only to lend me his notebooks, but to let me do my preparation with himself 
and some other students. I thanked him, and accepted the invitation, hoping by that conferment of honour completely to dissipate our old misunderstanding. But at the same time I requested that the gatherings should always be held at my home, since my quarters were so splendid. To this the students replied that they meant to take turn and turn about, sometimes to meet at one fellow's place, sometimes at another's, as might be most convenient. The first of our reunions was held at Zuchin's, who had a small partition room in a large building on the Trubny Boulevard. The opening night I arrived late, and entered when the reading aloud had already begun. The little apartment was thick with tobacco smoke, while on the table stood a bottle of vodka, a decanter, some bread, some salt, and a shin-bone of mutton. Without rising, Zuchin asked me to have some vodka, and to doff my tunic. "'I expect you are not accustomed to such entertainment,' he added. Every one was wearing a dirty cotton shirt and a dicky. Endeavouring not to show my contempt for the company, I took off my tunic, and lay down in a sociable manner on the sofa. Zuchin went on reading aloud, and correcting himself with the help of notebooks, while the others occasionally stopped him to ask a question, which he always answered with ability, correctness, and precision. I listened for a time with the rest, but not understanding much of it, since I had not been present at what had been read before, soon interpolated a question. "'Hello, old fellow! It will be no good for you to listen if you do not know the subject,' said Zuchin. "'I will lend you my notebooks, and then you can read it up by to-morrow, and I will explain it to you.' I felt rather ashamed of my ignorance. Also, I felt the truth of what he said. So I gave up listening, and amused myself by observing my new comrades. According to my classification of humanity, into persons comial foe, and persons not comial foe, they evidently belonged to the latter category, and so aroused in me not only a feeling of contempt, but also a certain sensation of personal hostility, for the reason that, though not comial foe, they accounted me their equal, and actually patronized me in a sort of good-humoured fashion. What in particular excited in me this feeling was their feet, their dirty nails and fingers, a particularly long talon on Operoff's obtrusive little finger, their red shirts, their dickies, the chaff which they good-naturedly threw at one another, their dirty room, a habit which Zuchin had of continually snuffling and pressing a finger to his nose, and above all their manner of speaking, that is to say, their use and intonation of words. For instance, they said flat for fool, just the ticket for exactly, grandly for splendidly, and so on all of which seemed to me either bookish or disagreeably vulgar. Still more was my comial foe refinement disturbed by the accents which they put upon certain Russian, and still more upon foreign, words. Thus they said, Dyatelnost, for Dyatelnost, Narokno, for Narokno, Vikamini, for Vikamini, Shakespeare, for Shakespeare, and so forth. Yet for all their insuperably repellent exterior I could detect something good in these fellows, and envied them the cheerful good fellowship which united them in one. Consequently, I began to feel attracted towards them, and made up my mind that, come what might, I would become of their number. The kind and honourable Operoff I knew already, and now the brusque but exceptionally clever Zuchin, who evidently took the lead in this circle, began to please me greatly. He was a dark, thick-set little fellow, with a perennially glistening, polished face, but one that was extremely lively, intellectual, and independent in its expression. That expression it derived from a low but prominent forehead, deep black eyes, short bristly hair, and a thick, dark beard which looked as though it stood in constant need of trimming. Although, too, he seemed to think nothing of himself, a trait which always pleased me in people, it was clear that he never let his brain rest. He had one of those expressive faces which a few hours after you have seen them for the first time change suddenly, and entirely to your view. Such a change took place, in my eyes, with regard to Zuchin's face, towards the end of that evening. Suddenly I seemed to see new wrinkles appear upon its surface, its eyes grow deeper, its smile become a different one, and the whole face assumed such an altered aspect that I scarcely recognized it. When the reading was ended, Zuchin, the other students, and myself manifested our desire to be comrades all by drinking vodka until little remained in the bottle. 
Thereupon Zuchin asked if any one had a quarter rouble to spare, so that he could send the old woman who looked after him to buy some more. Yet, on my offering to provide the money, he made as though he had not heard me, and turned to Operoff, who pulled out a purse sewn with bugles, and handed him the sum required. "'And mind you don't get drunk,' added the giver, who himself had not partaken of the vodka. "'By heavens!' answered Zuchin, as he sucked the marrow out of a mutton-bone. I remember thinking that it must be because he ate marrow that he was so clever. "'By heavens!' he went on, with a slight smile, and his smile was of the kind that one involuntarily noticed, and somehow felt grateful for. "'Even if I did get drunk, there would be no great harm done. I wonder which of us two could look after himself the better. You or I. Anyway, I am willing to make the experiment.' and he slapped his forehead with mock boastfulness. But what a pity it is that Semenov has disappeared! He has gone and completely hidden himself somewhere. Sure enough, the grey-haired Semenov, who had comforted me so much at my first examination by being worse dressed than myself, and who after passing the second examination had attended his lectures regularly during the first month, had disappeared thereafter from view, and never been seen at the university throughout the latter part of the course. "'Where is he?' asked someone. "'I do not know,' replied Zuchin. "'He has escaped my eye altogether. Yet what fun I used to have with him! What fire there was in the man! And what an intellect! I should be indeed sorry if he has come to grief. And come to grief he probably has, for he was no mere boy to take his university course in installments.' After a little further conversation, and agreeing to meet again the next night, at Zuchin's, since his abode was the most central point for us all, we began to disperse. As one by one we left the room, my conscience started pricking me because every one seemed to be going home on foot, whereas I had my droshky. Accordingly, with some hesitation, I offered Operoff a lift. Zuchin came to the door with us, and after borrowing a rouble of Operoff, went off to make a night of it with some friends. As we drove along, Operoff told me a good deal about Zuchin's character and mode of life and on reaching home it was long before I could get to sleep for thinking of the new acquaintances I had made. For many an hour, as I lay awake, I kept wavering between the respect which their knowledge, simplicity, and sense of honour, as well as the poetry of their youth and courage, excited in my regard, and the distaste which I felt for their outward man. In spite of my desire to do so, it was at that time literally impossible for me to associate with them, since our ideas were too wholly at variance. For me, life's meaning and charm contained an infinitude of shades of which they had not an inkling, and vice versa. The greatest obstacles of all, however, to our better acquaintance, I felt to be the twenty roubles worth of cloth in my tunic, my droshky, and my white linen shirt, and they appeared to me most important obstacles, since they made me feel as though I had unwittingly insulted these comrades by displaying such tokens of my wealth. I felt guilty in their eyes, and as though, whether I accepted or rejected their acquittal, and took a line of my own, I could never enter into equal and unaffected relations with them. Yet to such an extent did the stirring poetry of the courage which I could detect in Zuchin, in particular, overshadow the coarse, vicious side of his nature, that the latter made no unpleasant impression upon me. For a couple of weeks I visited Zuchin's almost every night for purposes of work, yet I did very little there, since, as I have said, I had lost ground at the start, and not having sufficient grit in me to catch up my companions by solitary study, was forced merely to pretend that I was listening to, and taking in, all they were reading. I have an idea, too, that they divined my pretense, since I often noticed that they passed over points which they themselves knew, without first inquiring of me whether I did the same. Yet day by day I was coming to regard the vulgarity of this circle with more indulgence, to feel increasingly drawn towards its way of life, and to find in it much that was poetical. Only my word of honour to Dmitri that I would never indulge in dissipation with these new comrades kept me from deciding also to share their diversions. Once I thought I would make a display of my knowledge of literature, particularly French literature, and so led the conversation to that theme. Judge, then, of my surprise when I discovered that not only had my companions been reading the foreign passages in Russian, but that they had studied far more foreign works than I had. 
and knew and could appraise English and even Spanish writers of whom I had never so much as heard. Likewise Pushkin and Zhukovsky represented to them literature, and not as to myself certain books in yellow covers which I had once read and studied when a child. For Dumas and Sue they had an almost equal contempt, and in general were competent to form much better and clearer judgments on literary matters than I was, for all that I refused to recognize the fact. In knowledge of music, too, I could not beat them, and was astonished to find that Operoff played the violin, and another student the cello and piano, while both of them were members of the university orchestra, and possessed a wide knowledge of, and appreciation of, good music. In short, with the exception of the French and German languages, my companions were better posted at every point than I was, yet not the least proud of the fact. True, I might have plumed myself on my position as a man of the world, but Woloda excelled me even in that. Wherein, then, lay the height from which I presumed to look down upon these comrades? In my acquaintanceship with Prince Ivan Ivanovitch? In my ability to speak French? In my droshki? In my linen shirt? In my finger-nails? Surely these things are all rubbish, was the thought which would come flitting through my head under the influence of the envy which the good fellowship and kindly youthful gaiety displayed around me excited in my breast. Every one addressed his interlocutor in the second person singular. True, the familiarity of this address almost approximated to rudeness, yet even the boorish exterior of the speaker could not conceal a constant endeavour never to hurt another one's feelings. The terms brute or swine, when used in this good-natured fashion, only convulsed me, and gave me cause for inward merriment. In no way did they offend the person addressed, or prevent the company at large from remaining on the most sincere and friendly footing. In all their intercourse these youths were delicate and forbearing in a way that only very poor and very young men can be. However much I might detect in Zuchin's character and amusements an element of coarseness and profligacy, I could also detect the fact that his drinking-bouts were of a very different order to the curility with burnt rum and champagne in which I had participated at Baron Z's. CHAPTER Forty Four, Zuchin and Semenov Although I do not know what class of society Zuchin belonged to, I know that, without the help either of means or social position, he had matriculated from the seventh gymnasium. At that time he was eighteen, though he looked much older, and very clever, especially in his powers of assimilation. To him it was easier to survey the whole of some complicated subject, to foresee its various parts and deductions, than to use that knowledge when gained for reasoning out the exact laws to which those deductions were due. He knew that he was clever, and of the fact he was proud. Yet from that very pride arose the circumstance that he treated every one with unvarying simplicity and good nature. Moreover, his experience of life must have been considerable, for already he had squandered much love, friendship, activity, and money. Though poor and moving only in the lower ranks of society, there was nothing which he had ever attempted for which he did not thenceforth feel the contempt, the indifference, or the utter disregard which were bound to result from his attaining his goal too easily. In fact, the very ardour with which he applied himself to a new pursuit seemed to be due to his contempt for what he had already attained, since his abilities always led him to success and therefore to a certain right to despise it. With the sciences it was the same. Though little interested in them, and taking no notes, he knew mathematics thoroughly, and was uttering no vain boast when he said that he could beat the professor himself. Much of what he heard said in lectures he thought rubbish, yet with his peculiar habit of unconsciously practical roguishness he feigned to subscribe to all that the professors thought important, and every professor adored him. True, he was outspoken to the authorities, but they none the less respected him. Besides disliking and despising the sciences, he despised all who laboured to attain what he himself had mastered so easily, since the sciences, as he understood them, did not occupy one-tenth part of his powers. In fact, life as he saw it from the student's standpoint contained nothing to which he could devote himself wholly, and his impetuous, active nature as he himself often said, demanded life complete, wherefore he frequented the drinking-bout in so far as he could afford it, 
and surrendered himself to dissipation chiefly out of a desire to get as far away from himself as possible. Consequently, just as the examinations were approaching, Operoff's prophecy to me came true, for Zuchin wasted two whole weeks in this fashion, and we had to do the latter part of our preparation at another student's. Yet at the first examination he reappeared with pale, haggard face, and tremulous hands, and passed brilliantly into the second course. The company of roisterers, of which Zuchin had been the leader since its formation at the beginning of the term, consisted of eight students, among whom, at first, had been numbered Ikonin and Semenov, but the former had left under the strain of the continuous revelry in which the band had indulged in the early part of the term, and the latter seceded later for reasons which were never wholly explained. In its early days this band had been looked upon with awe by all the fellows of our course, and had had its exploits much discussed. Of these exploits the leading heroes had been Zuchin, and towards the end of the term Semenov but the latter had come to be generally shunned, and to cause disturbances on the rare occasions when he attended a lecture. Just before the examinations began, he rounded off his drinking exploits in a most energetic and original fashion, as I myself had occasion to witness through my acquaintanceship with Zuchin. This is how it was. One evening we had just assembled at Zuchin's, and Operoff, reinforcing a candlestick with a candle stuck in a bottle, had just plunged his nose into his notebooks and begun to read aloud in his thin voice from his neatly written notes on physics, when the landlady entered the room and informed Zuchin that someone had brought a note for him. The remainder of this chapter is omitted in the original. CHAPTER Forty Five, I COME TO GRIEF At length the first examination, on differentials and integrals, drew near but I continued in a vague state which precluded me from forming any clear idea of what was awaiting me. Every evening, after consorting with Zuchin and the rest, the thought would occur to me that there was something in my convictions which I must change, something wrong and mistaken, yet every morning the daylight would find me again satisfied to be comme il faut, and desirous of no change whatsoever. Such was the frame of mind in which I attended for the first examination. I seated myself on the bench where the princes, counts, and barons always sat, and began talking to them in French, with the not unnatural result that I never gave another thought to the answers which I was shortly to return to questions in a subject of which I knew nothing. I gazed supinely at other students as they went up to be examined, and even allowed myself to chaff some of them. "'Well, Grap,' I said to Ilenka, who from our first entry into the university had shaken off my influence had ceased to smile when I spoke to him, and always remained ill-disposed towards me. "'Have you survived the ordeal?' "'Yes,' retorted Alenka. "'Let us see if you can do so.' I smiled contemptuously at the answer, notwithstanding that the doubt which he had expressed had given me a momentary shock. Once again, however, indifference overlaid that feeling, and I remained so entirely absent-minded and supine, that the very moment after I had been examined, a mere formality for me, as it turned out, I was making a dinner appointment with Baron Z. When called out with Ikonin, I smoothed the creases of my uniform, and walked up to the examiner's table with perfect sang-froid. True, a slight shiver of apprehension ran down my back when the young professor, the same one as had examined me for my matriculation, looked me straight in the face as I reached across to the envelope containing the tickets. Ikonin, though taking a ticket with the same plunge of his whole body as he had done at the previous examinations, did at least return some sort of an answer this time, though a poor one. I, on the contrary, did just as he had done on the two previous occasions, or even worse, since I took a second ticket, yet for a second time returned no answer. The professor looked at me compassionately in the face, and said in a quiet but determined voice, "'You will not pass into the second course, Monsieur.' Tenief, you had better not complete the examinations. The faculty must be weeded out. The same with you, Monsieur Ikonin. Ikonin implored leave to finish the examinations, as a great favor, but the professor replied that he, Ikonin, was not likely to do in two days what he had not succeeded in doing in a year, and that he had not the smallest chance of passing. Ikonin renewed his humble, piteous appeals, but the professor was inexorable. "'You can go, gentlemen,' 
he remarked in the same quiet, resolute voice. I was only too glad to do so, for I felt ashamed of seeming by my silent presence to be joining in Ikonin's humiliating prayers for grace. I have no recollection of how I threaded my way through the students in the hall, nor of what I replied to their questions, nor of how I passed into the vestibule and departed home. I was offended, humiliated, and genuinely unhappy. For three days I never left my room, and saw no one, but found relief in copious tears. I should have sought a pistol to shoot myself if I had had the necessary determination for the deed. I thought that Ilinka Grap would spit in my face when he next met me, and that he would have the right to do so, that Operoff would rejoice at my misfortune, and tell every one of it, that Koplikoff had justly shamed me that night in the restaurant, that my stupid speeches to Princess Kornikoff had their fitting result, and so on, and so on. All the moments of my life, which had been for me most difficult and painful, recurred to my mind. I tried to blame some one for my calamity, and thought that some one must have done it on purpose, must have conspired a whole intrigue against me. Next I murmured against the professors, against my comrades, Woloda, Dmitri, and Papa, the last for having sent me to the university at all. Finally I railed at Providence for ever having let me see such ignominy. Believing myself ruined for ever in the eyes of all who knew me, I besought Papa to let me go to the Hussars, or to the Caucasus. Naturally Papa was anything but pleased at what had happened, yet on seeing my passionate grief he comforted me by saying that, though it was a bad business, it might yet be mended by my transferring to another faculty. Woloda, who also saw nothing very terrible in my misfortune, added that at least I should not be put out of countenance in a new faculty, since I should have new comrades there. As for the ladies of the household, they neither knew nor cared what either an examination or a plucking meant, and condoled with me only because they saw me in such distress. Dmitri came to see me every day, and was very kind and consolatory throughout, but for that very reason he seemed to me to have grown colder than before. It always hurt me, and made me feel uncomfortable when he came up to my room and seated himself in silence beside me, much as a doctor might seat himself by the bedside of an awkward patient. Sophia Ivanovna and Veronika sent me books for which I had expressed a wish, as also an invitation to go and see them, but in that very thoughtfulness of theirs I saw only proud, humiliating condescension to one who had fallen beyond forgiveness. Although in three days' time I grew calmer, it was not until we departed for the country that I left the house, but spent the time in nursing my grief and wandering, fearful of all the household, through the various rooms. One evening, as I was sitting deep in thought and listening to Avdotia playing her waltz, I suddenly leapt to my feet, ran upstairs, got out the copy-book whereon I had once inscribed rules of my life, opened it, and experienced my first moment of repentance and moral resolution. True, I burst into tears once more, but they were no longer tears of despair. Pulling myself together, I set about writing out a fresh set of rules, in the assured conviction that never again would I do a wrong action waste a single moment on frivolity, or alter the rules which I now decided to frame. How long that moral impulse lasted, what it consisted of, and what new principles I devised for my moral growth, I will relate when speaking of the ensuing and happier portion of my early manhood. End of section 11 Recording by Bill Borst End of Youth by Leo Tolstoy Translated by C. J. Hogarth